So we've dealt with presuppositions in this issue and extremely important. Now we need to look at methodology. We want to look at comprehensiveness and depth, the historical grammatical method, historical criteria and E.P. Saunders. Adolf Schlatter, uh, comprehensiveness and depth. Adolf Schlatter, 16th of August 1852, 19th of May 1938 wrote over 400 papers on theology and New Testament studies excuse me he is ranked with one of the great theologians of modern times and equal in stature to that of Boltman his historical method is will be used for this lecture he advises that you avoid sectarian bias that you study all relevant material before you can come to any conclusion he seeks to understand the historical context of any given ancient text he gives equal time to primary source material and engaging with scholars in the field you are working. I think this method gives you the comprehensiveness and depth Adolf Schlatter's significance of method for theological work. B. The historical grammatical method. Next, I hope to use the historical grammatical method of Dr. Bob Upley. What that means is we get ancient text in the context. Um, and you can look at Dr. Bob Oakley's book on hermeneutics uh, at uh, www.freebiblecommentary.org uh, seminar textbook. Third, historical criteria. I hope to use the methods that historians use in assessing hypotheses for historical data. This means my methods try to keep within the mainstream of historical scholarship. Also, it is very important to note as we use the historian's tools it means we are using historical data as evidence and not presuming or defending an inspired Bible. I believe the Bible is the word of God, but my argument is an historical argument, sorry, based on historical evidence. Explanatory scope. These are some of the secular methods of doing history that I am using. I am not going to defend the Bible for the resurrection. I'm not going to use the Bible as my principal evidence here. I'm using secular methods of history to interpret ancient documents some of those documents are the bible but i'm not presuming that the bible is inspired at this point number one explanatory scope this is a secular method the hypothesis that has the most relevant facts has the best explanatory scope my historical criteria is as follows number two explanatory power this looks at quality of the given facts if you can explain your position with less ambiguity that it has better explanatory power if one has strong presence you may get some due to the nature of patchiness of history number three plausibility the hypothesis conforms to the background knowledge better than other positions we look at opponents views and see also if they are confirmed by anything in history or today by sciences number four less ad hoc when we use less non-evidence assumptions we are in a better position than using such arguments that lack any evidence number five illumination an hypothesis can provide good solutions to historical problems and if this is the position it strengthens one's case page 109 to 111 the resurrection of jesus might like owner a new historical approach uh, ivp 2010 he writes When conducting authentic historical investigation, one cannot presume that the sources with which they are working are inerrant or divinely inspired. Otherwise, we would simply conclude everything reported to those sources in true and raw, and wrap up the investigation. A theologian can do do that when studying Jesus. A historian does not have the luxury. Theology and history are a different disciplines with different objectives and approaches. Now I believe that everything in the Bible is true, but that's a statement of faith and has to be argued by reasons of a different sort. My objective in the book was to see what I could prove concerning Jesus' resurrection with reasonable and adequate historical certainty and apart from any faith commitment, Dr. Lycona, roundtable discussion with Mike Lycona on the resurrection of Jesus, a new historical historiographical approach Denny Atkin, Crane Blomberg, Paul Copan, Michael Kruger and Michael Lacona and Charles Qualls Southern Theological Review 
I'm using these historical methods and I'm use, basing my argument uh, for the resurrection on what we already know as well. So I'm using secular methods, but I'm also basing my argument on what we know as scholars. This is important because a lot of atheists will say that Jesus is a myth and they don't realize that modern scholarship has come to some certain results that Jesus did exist. So E.P. Saunders and the, the Academy is true that many lives of Jesus are produced by scholars and are biased. But at the same time, we must realize that modern scholarship has come to a general agreement about some facts as to the life of Jesus. It would be unwise to build a foundation without paying its respects and using some of this scholarship and its conclusions. What atheists do not tell you is Dr. Richard Carrier, Earl J. Doherty, David Fitzgerald and Robert Price are all skeptics who say Jesus never existed, which that makes them fringe scholars who would flying in the face of mainstream scholarship. I do not say, say I agree with all the methods and conclusions of mainstream scholarship, but at the same time I acknowledge we are making progress in our understanding of Jesus. Some of the facts we know about Jesus and most scholars agree on are as follows. Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. Jesus was a Galilean. He preached and did healings. Jesus had 12 disciples according to him. Jesus did his work for Israel. Jesus was controversial at the temple. Jesus was crucified outside Jerusalem by Roman authorities. After his death, Jesus' followers continued as a, a clear movement. A group of Jews persecuted at least parts of the new movement. Uh, the persecution continued up to the end of Paul's career. Jesus and Judaism, Philadelphia Fortress Press, E.P. Sanders, 1985. So, uh, let's look at some evidence. First of all, evidence of the Gospels. The Gospels can be traced back to show that they are uh, early historical source material. Now, when I say early, I mean early. There's early is in three types for me. There's early in saying that the Gospels uh, were written before AD 70. That's a different debate. I believe that. But for the sake of argument here, I'm just using what general scholars use. When I mean early, I mean early in the sense of a, a professional historian would see early source material. Early source material could be within the first 50 to 100 years, even the first two, 300 years. Early means you've got good grounds to say that this material is helpful material to come to understand the historical significance of the events that you're looking at. That's what I mean by early. Okay. Right. AD 180 AD. Tatian, an Assyrian, a Christian theologian, lived about 120 180. His text, the Diasatron, is a harmony of the four Gospels. The text was used by Syriac speaking churches and was a standard text for Christians of that time. 150 AD, Justin Martin, first apology. Quote, um, quotes the Gospel of John, chapter 3, Apologize, 61, 4, 5, 130 AD. Eusebius, the historian, says that Papias talks about the writings by Matthew and Mark when Papias wrote his five-volume exposition of the oracles of the Lord about 130. This is backed up by the Ryland's papyri that contains a fragment of John's Gospel dating at 130 AD. This means the Gospel of John was much earlier. 120 AD, Polycarp, a disciple of G Apostle John, in his letter of Philippian Church, he quotes from the Gospels and the other New Testament books. 100 AD, the Dedicae was a teaching used widely by the Church. The writer quotes from Matthew and the Lord on the Lord's Prayer. 95 AD, Clement quotes Matthew in 1 Clement 13, 1-2. All this evidence shows that the Gospels are first century documents. They are written when the live witnesses were around. To quote the Gospels as the fathers did show that they were much widely used and circulated. This would have taken time to copy and send them around the ancient world. It is reasonable to assume early dates for the Gospels to account for the wide use of these texts. The scholars who agree with this, and I give them a, a list of scholars, Jean Carmigak, Philip Rowland, Karsten Peter Thede, 
uh, John Arthur Thomas Robinson, etc. Ever, uh, more details, early eyewitnesses of Jesus, J. Warner Wallace. Um, we read in Ignatius' letter, uh, Tralians 9-4, J. and Delhi Kelly, Early Christian Creeds, London, Longman, 1963, page 68. Jesus Christ was the stock of David who was from the Mary. He was truly born and ate and drank, was truly persecuted under Pontius Pilate, was truly crucified and died, who also was truly raised from the dead, his father raising him. Ignatius based his comments on the Gospels. He knows at least three Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke. Matthew, Luke and John. Um... He also quotes the text Matthew twelve twenty three uh, in Ephesia, in his a letter Ephesians four two. He quotes uh, Luke twenty four thirty nine in his letter to Smyrians in three two, and in John three eight. He quotes this in in his letter Philadelph seven one. Also note page twenty eight of the Gospel of Truth Paul Barnett. IVP two thousand and twelve Ignatius wrote about one ten A D. So it puts the Gospels as first century historical source material. So what what I'm what I'm saying is that this gospel material is well within the criteria of, of early historical material and is a good basis to be able to come to an understanding of whether Jesus Christ died and rose again from a historical fair perspective. Next thing I want to know is want to share is that the Gospels uh, are accurate historical documents. Now the historical evidence for this is many pieces of evidence. Uh, Bethesda in John 144 this text tells us Andrew and Peter came from the city they were fishermen. Archaeologists discovered a plethora of fishing implements in a house in Beth Bethsaida. In Cana, John 2, 1, 11, archaeologists who think Kerbet Cana is the place where Jesus did the miracles of turning water into wine found storage facilities for water. Pool of Bethesda. John describes a pool called Bethesda. In John 5, 2, in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, uh, von Walder writes, The discovery of the pools proves beyond doubt that the description of this pool was not the creation of the evangelist, but reflected accurate and detailed knowledge of Jerusalem. Uh, inscription about Pontius Pilate is mentioned in all four Gospels and we found this um, the boy Jesus in the temple in Luke 2 41 50 the discovery of a stairway south of the southern wall on the Mount temple makes it clear that it was there that the young Jesus amazed the rabbis by his knowledge and basically there's a whole plethora of historical material that we found that proves that the Gospels are reliable when they comment about history they are accurate and we should be more of a what we would call as historians a maximist position rather than a minimalist position to the gospels that's important in this debate of whether jesus rose from the dead because if we can't rely on the gospel material then our whole argument falls to the ground but if there is good historical evidence to show that the gospels are accurate historically then it puts us in a better position to know whether what they're saying is actually accurate. If we compare the Gnostic Gospels, we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there and we'll come back to uh, the historical issues of the Gospels.